Okay. All right. Thank you. We like to see the full credits here. So especially for a film like that, there's so much to learn from all of the credits. And also the in memoriam at the end is quite exceptional. All the people that we heard about. Um, so before we get started with some uh, chit chat and Q and A's, I want to introduce Paul Gordon, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, he's the senior film conservator for Library and Archives Canada. Uh, he's an independent film producer, film projectionist, and graduate of Ryerson's film program. Paul was also involved in the founding of Western Arctic Moving Pictures, a video film co-op based in Yellowknife. He promotes film preservation wherever he can and is a programmer for the Lost Dominion Screening Collection, which focuses on showing Canadian archival films on film. Uh, so please welcome both Bill and Paul to the stage. Thanks. Okay, so to get started, there's so many questions actually that I have and so many entry points to this film. Um, but maybe since we have both of you here, um, if you could talk a little bit about um, first discovering the, the collection with Paul, from what I understand, you were visiting. Paul invited you to Ottawa for a film event and let you know, you know, come come to my work and check out these amazing collections. Um, so I'd be really interested in knowing how you were able to view the films, if they were on film, if they were already digitized, uh, and how you went about organizing them or get wrapping your head around so much content. Yeah, just to clarify, I mean, this was a, at one point it was a well-known story among film archivists and people interested in ancient film. Um, so I first heard about the Dawson City Film Collection um, either in the late 80s or early 90s um, when I was a film student. And um, I always thought it would be a cool project to make a film about the collection and using the collection. Uh, so that it was like, I have a very full sock drawer of ideas, you know, and this was just one more sock, you know. and. Um, it wasn't until, I guess, late 2012 or early 2013, Paul contacted me and invited me up to um, Ottawa to show Dikasia. And in our email correspondence, he mentioned that he I sh would be maybe interested in seeing his day job, which was digital migration of the collection. And at that point, I asked, well, don't you have Dawson City? And he said, yes, of course, we have Dawson City among this, also this fantastic 28 millimeter collection. And he um, gave me a list of things that, um, some of which I might still pursue, <laughs> you know. Uh, but um, at any rate, um, when I got to Ottawa, um, I believe it was that first trip, um, I visited Paul's work, and he'd pulled some of the prints um, of the the safety prints um, from the Dawson collection, and uh, you know, I started to just troll through them on uh, 35 millimeter Steenbeck, and um, I don't know, I got through maybe. 10 that day, and I realized that it might be quicker to have them scanned first and then <laughs> look at them as digital files later. But I, I came back um, again in uh, January and of the following year of 2014, and then in June of 2014. So I did three trips where I was looking in, at the films expressly on, um, on acetate, and then, um, and then later I would ship enormous 12 terabyte drives to Paul and he would give me everything I wanted. So it was a <laughs> great relationship. <laughs> I'm just curious, were these films publicly available? Could a member of the public just go in and watch them or no? Uh, a research yeah, they're, they're all public domain, so they're easily accessible, um, but easily is a, you know. Uh, easily on a steam bag. Yeah, you know, the, the, the major way for a researcher to see something would actually physically come to Ottawa and watch it uh, in Library and Archives Canada. So it was a little, we were just starting to try to get a YouTube channel up, and now now we do have actually quite a few of the Dawson films on there, uh, probably about 400 films total. Um, but before that, yeah, you you basically you have to have a request. Um, we'd, we'd telecine or digitize the films and put it on a DVD, and then you'd watch it downtown. And... Uh, you know, during during this phase when Bill was coming up, it was like a transition from the old school way of doing things to rolling in a new 4K film scanner. So it was kind of ideal timing, in a way, because now we could actually you know digitize the films properly, and even go back to some of the original nitrate. You know, as much as 
all these films were preserved onto, onto film, doing optical printing or contact printing to safety stock, now we could go back to the original nitrate and scan it again and get better results. So, And you can see some of the, uh, the footage that has that amber golden hue to it was actual nitrate original that yep. we scanned for. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that was really the, the clinching uh, argument when uh, Paul said they were getting a new 4K scanner. I realized that technology had created, uh, had caught up that I could actually make the film that I envisioned making decades before that would have just been prohibitively expensive and time consuming to do as film on film. Um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about how you approached uh, crafting the narrative? Because it sort of ebbs back and forth in time. We discover piece by piece a little bit about the history of Dawson, all the people, all these amazing you know, synergies between the history of film projection and, and cinema houses. Um, it must have been a pretty complex process. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, I mean, it, it got more and more complex the deeper I got into it. Um, certainly... Um, the first thing I wanted to do was just unpack that this was a real story because when I heard it, it almost sounded mythological, and I certainly had heard it mistold. Or uh, you know, I was one time I was in the Library of Congress, and a CNN news team was there, and uh, one of the archivists there was saying, "Oh yeah, there was this uh, collection that was found under a bowling alley in Alaska," you know, and you know, so it was already starting to jump the rails a little bit. I thought, you know, and. and um, the really extraordinary thing, one of the first things Paul showed me was that there was this typewritten letter from Clifford Thompson, and um, that is pretty rare for any archaeological find to have this kind of smoking gun, which says, yes, this is what this is. I put it there. This is why, you know. Um, so really using that letter as sort of a shooting script, if you will, I was able to search the database. There was a pretty um, elaborate database um, uh, you know, listing all the titles and uh, the year they were made and sometimes the producer and the director and some descriptive elements. So I was able to go through it and um, uh, search for things that I thought were pertinent to the story, um, whether they were actual actions or um, titles like The End of the Rainbow, you know, or something like that. You know, I, I knew that they would um, be useful. And... Um, but the more and more I dug into the collection, I also became really uh, enamored with the newsreels and um, the social history that it told. And um, I, I knew all along that the film would start with the discovery of gold um, at the confluence of the Yukon and Klondike Rivers. And that incredibly uh, coincidentally was the same year that um, commercial cinema, uh, for all intents and purposes, began. Um, and so that you had this uh, convergence of cinema and gold and how these two things met up again in Dawson City, um, you know, decades later, um, of course, would be the, the unraveling of the, the 20th century and in some ways a condensed version of the story of capitalism and um, so that the newsreel material all fed into that. And, and then, you know, um, Paul sh directed me to incredible footage that, um, you know, that we had. There was home movie footage um, uh, originally stored at the Yukon Archive, but uh, George Black and Harry Lewis um, to find, you know, the actual D3A theater on fire and the Orpheum on fire. That's not footage of some other fire. Those are those actual theaters burning down. And uh, that there was um, family footage that had become a travelogue footage of Chief Isaac, um, you know, um, years later, um, now the mayor of Moosehide. And um, th there was an uh, incredible amount of supporting material. There was all the paper print material from the 1890s and 1900s, early 1900s showing, you know, the gold rush. And uh, Dawson City was just an extraordinarily well-mediated city. There was all the Eric Hegg photographs and that extraordinary story of how the Eric Hegg uh, negatives were found within the cabin. Um, um, you know, that was a also a myth, uh, something um, that couldn't be proven. And, the, the you know, some people said there were 2,000 negatives and other people said there were 200 and nobody could name the, the woman who'd found them or the boss or uh, what year it was. And uh, with one simple phone call to Kathy, she called up her friend Irene. She was like, oh, yeah, I found those glass negatives in the cabin. You know, here's my wedding picture. You know, so. 
So, uh, you know, there was, uh, it was, it was, I liken it to a jigsaw puzzle. You know, I, I, I knew where some of the corners and edges were, but there were some crucial links, some crucial pieces of the puzzle that remained open till almost the very end. And um, it was a bit of walking on water at times to hope that those puzzles would get filled in. You know. uh, in the context of the Real Heritage Symposium, uh, we're talking a lot about the idea of shared public memory and having cultural artifacts contribute to building memories. Um, and your film obviously is a lot about recovering these memories. Uh, and we see even in the context the remembering the discovery of the nitrate and the burying comes back, it sort of ebbs and flows throughout even yes. within that population. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit just about the film as sort of a memory medium. It seems to recur in a lot of your work also, so I'm just curious about your thoughts on film as memory. Yeah, I mean, this, this was um, partly what really drew me to this story. I'm just noticing in my lifetime um, how this story had all almost been forgotten, um, you know, that. I thought it was a well-known story that was still being repeated, but as it turns out, it was only being repeated by a certain generation to each other, <laughs> and that um, people younger than me hadn't heard of this, or people who weren't associated with film archives hadn't. But it was also interesting to see sort of in that um, news account of from, I guess it would be 1937 or 38 after the D3A had uh, burnt down and um, and you know, there's a newspaper account of how the children are finding these um, uh, film reels. And, and if you read carefully there, they're saying, you know, in an ancient time, this was a depository for, uh, for films, you know, in long ago times. Well, that was only eight years earlier. So uh, <laughs> that had already been forgotten or it was never known. And then some people held that knowledge, you know, um, uh, Kathy talks about the gentleman who said, oh, I knew it was there all along, you know, but he didn't share that, and or maybe some other people he played hockey with knew about it who were kids at the time. Um, so uh, there's also the difference between oral history and sort of a known or assumed history and then that which is recorded, you know. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, Clifford Thompson's history was recorded because he wrote a typewritten letter and that could be saved, you know, um, but that could have easily have been forgotten as well. And um, uh, so there was this whole, um, I think it's a beautiful metaphor, this idea that the nitrate was frozen underneath and then every 10 years or so it would emerge and uh, people would light it on fire and then it would go back down. And I feel like that's happened once again, you know, maybe with this film, it's come back up to the surface, but God knows in 10 years, people might have forgotten about this film as well. And so um, it, it, it will continue to ebb and flow. I just have one final question and then we'll open it up. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Um, just uh, in the credits, there's a long list of archives and collections that you completed research at or you borrowed films from. Um, and you do often collaborate not only with musicians, but with archivists, it seems, and uh, conservators. I um, wonder if you could talk a little bit just more broadly about how you got into that um, so consistently sort of across your films, working with found footage and also working primarily with decayed footage as sort of a way to intervene with the film image and why that's become important. Um, well, for one thing, I came out of painting, so I was interested in plastic arts and the degree to which cinema is a plastic art, so the, the way in which it um, relates to the physical world and can be affected by the physical, physical world, stored and also can age. Um, and um, so that's always been, a, uh, I guess, a guiding principle. Um, you know, with, with, I also think of cinema as somehow um, the best model that we've come up with for uh, storytelling and for uh, expressing some sort of subjective view, you know, that we can have a moving image and a soundtrack play um, is a great way of communicating ideas and stories and dreams um, that we've only had really at our disposal the last 120 years or so. Uh, so the, these, um, the vestiges of that and in the, throughout the 20th century, that was film, or physical film, um, you know, are, is uh, uh, easily understood as memory. You know, if, if these are experiences, then these roles are memories. And um, they all look pretty much the same when you look at them from the outside, but when you get into them, they're all, they all tell different stories in different ways. And so um, 
uh, I think of them as um, some sort of uh, crude model for the human experience. And um, so, so delving through archives um, has been my way of trying to talk about the human experience um, from the outside. Okay, so I think we'll open up uh, if you have any questions for Paul or Bill, and just wait till you get a mic from one of our volunteers. Sorry, I pointed to him first, so we'll go to him first. Thanks. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Was there a legal challenge to the ownership of these films, and could there be a legal challenge to the ownership of these films? Just the backstory on that. Uh, specifically to the films that were found in the, uh, well, you want to talk about that? Um, you know, a lot of the major studios like Fox and Universal and Paramount always want to, like, try to, you know, um, re-copyright their films so that they continuously can make money. But uh, those films have not been, um, they're, they've fallen into public domain. So basically anything I in the Dawson collection is fully accessible and anybody can use it. Um, Maybe because a lot of the films are incomplete, um, especially the, the feature films that are, um, they haven't tried to like uh, add a new copyright to the to the films, like w like Disney would do, for example, for like an old Mickey Mouse from uh, the early '30s. Um, but you know, the main thing that uh, uh, a lot of newsreels they're 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 considered actionality footage, so it, it's hard to copyright them um, after a certain amount of years. Um, and home movies, it's generally 50 years is the rule. So um, after 50 years, of uh, it should fall into the public domain, you know. But there, there's different rights depending on the countries, and uh, you know, it, there, there's a bit of a gray zone definitely for certain stuff. I mean, in the U.S., it was 75 years, and it just got moved to 95 years, but. Virtually, this entire collection is older than 95 years. So, no, we haven't run into any problems with the uh, with the actual Dawson City film find stuff. Um, there was a lot of other stuff we had to license, you know. But um, I would say every I has been dotted and every T has been crossed. Thanks. I was kind of curious. We've got um, some found footage from what 70 years lost before we find it. And now we've digitized it so that it's accessible to all. But I'm just wondering what we find 70 years from now. You know, we've got bits and bytes on different types of medias that aren't accessible. I'm just wondering from a film archivist perspective, kind of how important is the, the physical, the tangible, and maybe what it was like working with it compared to the media you now have today. And, what the future looks like for, you know, the next hundred years from now when they find this film in, in some forgotten basement or some forgotten disc. Well, I mean, thank God we've had the chance to do a film out, so we've turned the digital file, which was the master, um, which you saw here tonight, into a 35 millimeter print with the great assistance of the Museum of Modern Art. So uh, there is a film print that will outlive me and it will certainly outlive this DCP that we saw tonight, um, you know, God knows what would happen to any of our digital files if we buried them for 50 years, you know. Um, it's hard enough just to get them to update with our new operating systems, you know. So um, uh, it from I, I think I speak for Paul as well. From an archivist standpoint, 35 millimeter is the Rosetta Stone. That's the only really acceptable uh, medium that um, people feel uh, can stand the test of time and go forward, and no matter what civilization finds it, um, we'll be able to figure out how to put it onto the the lingua franca of the of the day. Um, uh, you know, the it's been said that we're living in a uh, a dark age of media. You know that um, um, much of the movies that are being made today, um, and for the last fifteen years, and maybe for five years going out, will will be lost, you know, because um, we're in this um, habit of, du you know, trying to upgrade digital files to the next platform, and uh, we haven't found a stable system that um, can survive the test of time yet. Yeah, it's definitely going to be, you know, um, <laughs> we're going to be well, we're going to be, there's going to be better records 
in the days of typewriters than there is now. Let's just say that, you know, um, uh, Library and Archives is really good at, at dealing with physical things. We've been really good with our film vaults. They're probably the, the top of the most top of line vaults in the world, you know, minus 18 Celsius, you know, 25 humidity. You're talking like 500 years for a polyester print. That we know is going to be okay, but what is a was a digital file going to be like? You know, right now we're going to LTO tape. It's called linear tape open. It, it's basically taking a digital file and going back to a, a magnetic format to store these digital files because it's the only thing that's it's more stable than a spinning disk. But still, the life expectancy for that is an upgrade every five years to the new LTO format. So we're going to lose a lot of digital information. Now there's a lot of stuff that we might not care that we lose, but the, <laughs> but uh, there's going to be other information that's going to be maybe vital that we'll lose, and you know that it is the digital dilemma, and it's something we, we're going to have to deal with. Going back to film is one option, but you can't do that for everything, right? So, I mean, it, it, I liken it to um, the, the beginning of cinema. Um, there was a there was no copyright motion picture copyright law until 1912 or something like that. So. Uh, from 1896 to 1912, producers hit upon the solution of making a contact photographic print from every negative, um, the paper prints, um, a dozen of which we saw here tonight. Um, uh, and those paper rolls got filed in the Library of Congress as copy uh, unprojectable but as legal documents um, purportedly to um, protect some producers' um, provenance for that film. Uh, but they outlived all the original <laughs> negatives and prints that they came from and, um, and also outlived many decades of nitrate film that followed so that we have this incredibly complete and robust record um, today of primitive film from 1896 to 1912 because all those paper rolls have been reprinted. But um, we lost so much nitrate in uh, nitrate fires and disuse and well, producers would also destroy films because they didn't want them copied. Um, so um, it, it's kind of ironic that sometimes the uh, these periods get saved for the strangest reasons and I think Dawson City is another example of that. Um, before we take another question, Paul, could you tell us a little bit about the Library and Archives um, film preservation mandate or sort of your larger project, I guess? Uh, sure. Uh, Library Archives is a, a part of Heritage Canada, and our mandate is to um, preserve Canada's documentary heritage. So anything that we think is of, of importance to Canadians, we will preserve. Now, there's things where there's direct deposits, like Telefilm or Canadian Television Fund, where we would automatically get deposited before they, you know, a Telefilm feature could get their tax credit. We'd get two copies. Um, so in a way, that was an automatic preservation set up. Library of Congress is a little different where they get everything because people don't get their copyright until it's deposited. Library and Archives Canada, Canada is not like that. So there's many things that are kind of slipping by that could probably be, you know, archivists could be seeking out. But, you know, we've got some of the best vaults in the world. Um, we've really tried to, to, to save as much as we can. We also store a lot of NFBs uh, films. As you noticed, NFB lost a lot of their nitrate in uh, that fire. Luckily, we had a lot of it in our nitrate vaults, um, so not all of it was lost. So we have all original Norman McLaren's nitrate hand-painted films. Um, and um, we also have a lot of CBC um, material. So we have a, a wide uh, collection of, of films going back to 1895 till, till present. Of course, things have, have switched to digital, but we, we still also book films. Um, so people can like like TIFF or uh, Cinematex and stuff can still show film on film. So, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Hi, uh, you kind of alluded to this. Uh, some of the films had water damage, multiple other types of damage to them. How long would it take to restore or preserve one of the reels of film that was found in Dawson City? Um, if you're doing it the old route that they would have done when we originally, when originally the films came into Library and Archives Canada, they would have been rewashed to try to bring life back to the film because they were some were brittle or some were uh, 
coupling or melded together or just like in, in a state where you couldn't run it through a projector. Because basically optical printing is, is basically a projector projecting the film and then a camera taking a picture of every single frame. And the operator may have to adjust the frame if there's uh, registration issues or shrinkage issues, but basically that's what it is. It's like you're making a new negative of every frame of the original film. And that's what was originally done with the Library of Congress and at Library and Archives Canada. So there were safety rolls made of, of all those films, and those were stored in our vaults. And then when you come to digitizing, you can either digitize those safety stock reels, which is very easy. You just call up the film, put it on the film scanner, and you can literally do it in almost real time and, and scan it at 4K. Or you go back to the original nitrate, which is you're going to get a lot of the, the, if it was tinted in tone, you're going to get those colors because a lot of sunlight error stuff was just shot into black and white when it was optically printed. So, and you're also going to get a better sharpness out of it digitizing. So in a way, it's better to go back to the nitrate now. Now you may have to clean it. You may have to go through it again and make sure the splices are going to hold because you're talking cement splices that are over 100 years old. But generally, you're going to get better results now than you would have when you were optically printing it back in the 70s. So, so that's a process. So we're kind of like, a, we've got, we're still running a, a physical lab at Library and Archives Canada. So we are still optically printing and we are still processing film in a lab. But we are also scanning film at the same time. So we're kind of crossing those two two worlds. So I'm a little, oh, what's, <laughs> so I'm a little reluctant asking this question just because it's for my own interest, not probably the public. Um, you mentioned CBC material at the archives. What would be the, the licensing of that material for a film versus public domain stuff that we spoke of already? Yeah, unfortunately, CBC and NFB are crown corporations, and they seem to want to continuously want to make money off their content, even though Canadians have physically paid for it once. They want Canadians to pay for it again and, and again and again and Americans. So it, it's unfortunate. There is some NFB stuff that has fallen into the public domain, or you could conceivably say, well, it's a government film. Government laws are, a government film is 50 years, and it should fall into the public domain, right? But CBC's not quite government, same as CBC, so it's this weird gray line where they continuously want to make money off their stock footage, which is unfortunate. Um, so yeah, we're kind of in a dilemma there when it comes to CBC stuff, where we can't just throw it on YouTube. Um, you'd have to go directly to them to deal with the copyright. Um, you know, eventually, as the years roll by, some of this stuff will fall into public domain, but it's generally 90 years. So, you know, talking CBC, you know, television is in the 50s, so we still, you know, still got a bit of time. I'd say the CBC and NFB stuff was some of the most expensive stuff I licensed for this film. Uh, yeah, I have a... I guess you'd call it more of a technical question. You mentioned about in, I mean, I look at the condition of the film. It's it's covered with dirt and all kinds of things, plus the water damage and all. And I'm thinking, well, how do you take that? What, like, okay, you're actually going to wash this. So what do you use? Is it like some kind of alcohol? Is it glycerin? I mean, what do you actually use to actually technically get the film to a state where it's actually... Uh, something you could run through a scanner or something. Forget a projector. Maybe it's it's shrunk, it's brittle, the splices are coming apart. But what do you do to actually clean the film up? Because some of that looked totally marvelous. I'm looking at it and saying, you, I mean, this, these are film prints that have been run. And I guess by the time they got to Dawson, they'd been run in various theaters and they just transferred the prints to the next location and so on. And as I've done some reading, the film prints were considered to be consumables. So, for example, there's a massive amount of film that ended up in New Zealand, and they said, just keep it, throw it away. <laughs> Don't send it back, it's too expensive. So we're looking at prints that are not out of the lab where they look marvelously new, but you look and it's like the amount of scratching in that is very minimal. So I'm just wondering, what do you do to get the film back to that condition? Like physically, what do you throw it into or what machines do you use, etc.? cetera? Uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of options now, but when they were optically printing it, they would wet gate it, which is basically, it's liquid that, it's two glass plates that are between the frame that are filled with liquid, and it's usually perk, which is the old dry cleaning stuff they'd use in dry cleaners, which is super toxic, but it has a really good refractive ability. 
And what it would do is that liquid would fill in the base scratches. Because base, base scratches are just refracted light that are causing you to see a scratch, right? So they'd fill in that scratch. So that was definitely done on some of these prints. So they might have been way more scratched than what you see now, but because they were wet gated, a lot of the scratches are reduced. Now, when it comes to dirt and stuff, some dirt is embedded, and you would basically have to do it by hand every frame if you really wanted to clean it up. Or you'd have to bring it into some type of digital system like Digital Vision Phoenix, where you know there's a digital software that's looking at the neg dirt and the pause dirt and, and, and removing it. That wasn't done for this stuff, because this is before that. But definitely the wet gate gets rid of scratches. Um, uh, Rewashing is more to to get the film unmelded, you know, some of the film is stuck together, um, or it's it's so cupped or so warped that it would be very difficult to get through an optical printer or scanner, so they would rewash it, and then they'd quickly have a very short amount of time to actually optically print it or scan it before it would go back to its old state. So, Paul directed me to a video that um, Bill O'Farrell, who you saw sitting next to Sam Kula, um, directed because if I'm not mistaken, they developed a rewash technique expressly for the Dawson collection, uh, where they basically took your standard processing developing tank and replaced it with distilled water, and so that it soaked it, and then it went through the hypo, which hardened it again, and then it came up off, and it was ready for optical printing, or at the time, video scanning. Uh, if you get the Blu-ray of Dawson City Frozen Time, there's a 10-minute postscript uh, that I cut together that um, includes that footage as well as what happened to the the reels after they left the Yukon. Hi, I was just curious on your thoughts on projecting nitrate film. Um, every year I go to the nitrate picture show in Rochester and see nitrate prints. Um, I know how rare they can be and how potentially dangerous it could be. And I know Canadian laws are a lot different for projecting nitrate in, than in Canada than they are in the U.S., but I just thought of one of your opinions on projecting it. I've seen nitrate projected um, in two different venues. In MoMA, I saw a nitrate print of Casablanca, which was like one of the most beautiful things I ever saw projected. Um, Ingrid Bergman's skin actually glowed. And then at, I was at the TCM festival earlier this year with this film, and each night they had a they had outfitted the Egyptian to be a nitrate ready. So each each night they showed a uh, a nitrate print, and I got to say the the black and white prints are really remarkable. Um, whereas the color prints are like beautiful color prints. They they didn't have a shimmer that was different. Um, the nitrate print is uh, the nitrate stock is generally um, clearer more clear than an uh, acetate stock, so the whites are brighter. Uh, and with almost everything from those days, um, and this would also speak to why some of this stuff looks so good, um, it was all the first generation uh, printed directly from the camera original. It, you know, it was before they had inner negatives or inner positives, so uh, you were seeing when it was clear, it was very clear. You know? um, so I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if necessarily Canada has different laws in the States regarding nitrate booths. I just don't think anyone's wanted to set up a nitrate booth. Maybe it's something that this place should do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, because they can't hear. We can hear you, but they can't. Thank you. Well, I thought it was a fantastic a movie, a fantastic Thank story, you. the whole thing, really uh, inspiring. Uh, what uh, got my curiosity, the quality of the Chilkoot Pass, uh, the moving pictures, I thought it was remarkably good, considering it was 1897, 1898, something like that. And was that really original motion picture that was shot at the time, or is it maybe That's something it. from a movie produced? What, what you're seeing for the Chilkoot Pass, um, is uh, is the Hague photographs that have been animated? You see them moving by, and then for the um, the reenactment of the guys climbing up the pass, that's taken from Chaplin's Gold Rush, from twenty five. The avalanche is from the Trail of ninety eight, which is nineteen twenty eight. Um, so it's a you know it's it's where I start introducing Hollywood movies to tell the story as well. 
I think the, all of them are labeled. All those shots. Yeah. Any other questions? We're going once. Oh, all right. We have a taker. It, it's not a question. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed the film. Um, my grandmother, her family went from Seattle up for the gold rush, and she grew up there. So for me to, to see this, the whole story is quite fantastic. Thanks a lot. <laughs> There's always somebody in the audience who had a relative who did it. <laughs> so thank you. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Thank you both, Bill and Paul, Thank for you. coming, bringing this amazing film for us. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming, everyone. There will be a video of the Q&A posted to the Real Heritage website it's later. <laughs> to be determined. You can check that out.